record button. And we will begin the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Arlen, thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sylvia Rogel. I'm Director of Strategic Partnerships and External Affairs for the Center Resources for Teaching and Learning. Uh, that can be a mouthful sometimes. Um, first, I wanna start off by saying thank you so much to uh, the folks at Illinois Principals Association. Arlen, you've been uh, super awesome in hosting us this afternoon. Um, so thank you for making it happen. Um, today, we will be discussing the opportunity to uh, implement high quality math, uh, standards-based mathematics uh, education to support all students from English learners to special needs. Uh, this is a critical conversation to have um, if you have a disability or whether you're an English learner should not dictate whether you can have quality math instruction. Um, and our friends at Math for All will, um, will join my, um, our specialist, our education specialist from the Illinois Resource Center to discuss a program which aims to bring together uh, teams from schools to participate in this you know, research-based professional development to enhance skills in planning and adapting math lessons to ensure that all students can achieve um, high quality learning outcomes in mathematics. Um, as you are listening to this conversation, I want you to consider this, um, medical imaging, artificial intelligence, sports, the internet, the cell phone, the computer that you are you know, watching this through, it all runs on math. Um, so, as we're thinking about this, um, you know, I want to pose to you a question is like, how can we can remain competitive in a world without rigorous math instructions if it seems to be vital and an aspect to our daily lives in just about everything we use. So with that, I want to introduce um, our friends at Math for All. Babette Muller is a distinguished scholar and leader in educational research, development and equity at the Education Development Center. Uh, she is principal investigator for Math for All. Uh, Matt McLeod is a professional development designer and facilitator at Education Development Center. Uh, and after 50 years of experience as a classroom teacher and instructional coach, his focus now is on ways to provide equitable uh, access to Math for All students. Rachel Anderson is an education specialist at the Illinois Resource Center. Uh, she has taught in bilingual and dual language programs at the elementary level and was a bilingual program director for Belvedere School Districts. Uh, Rachel has experience in creating and implement dual language programs and her interests include bilingualism and biliteracy and equitable access for emergent bilingual students. Christina uh, Sanchez Lopez is also an education specialist at the IRC. She collaborates with educators nationally and internationally on supporting multilingual learners with special education needs, culturally and linguistically responsive multi-tiered systems of support, mathematics, literacy, multilingual education, and engaging parents. Elizabeth Trost is um, our education specialist with the IRC and spent most of her life, uh, most of her career, excuse me, at Chicago Public Schools with 12 years as a self-contained ESL teacher and three years as a bilingual ESL specialist. Um, she spent two years, uh, two and a half years in Palestine, two of, uh, two of which were with the academic coordinator at a private bilingual schools in the West Bank. Um, her interests include refugee and newcomer students, multilingual classrooms and biliteracy development. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to get this conversation going. Um, I will kick it off to Babette. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sylvia, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, Matt will be sharing our slide deck. Uh, and um, so we will be uh, talking about uh, reaching diverse learners in the mathematics classroom. We have uh, our logos and our agenda for today is um, giving you a quick um, overview of why we need to take action and improving um, mathematics um, performance for all students. And then we will share with you um, uh, some information about the Math for All 
program and the neurodevelopmental framework that we're using as a tool within that program. Math for All is a professional development program. And uh, we are currently uh, funded by the US Department of Education to do a lot of work in Illinois. And we're very excited about the partnership with the IRC, which um, we will allow us to um, be able to offer Math for All in a sustained manner, even after our grant funding ends. So we will tell you more about this as part of this um, session. And uh, so the uh, specialists from the IRC who we've been working with will um, uh, you know, uh, share their, um, their thoughts about the program and um, some uh, preliminary plans for um, continuing this work in, in the state of Illinois um, beyond um, this current school year. And we'll have, at the end, we'll have some time for question and answers. Could go to the next slide. So um, Sylvia already uh, shared with you the importance of mathematics. I think you know many of you are math educators who joined us today, and I think you all share a strong belief that mathematics is essential for everyone to function in everyday life and to have a successful career. Unfortunately, though, the data that we have available um, is not very encouraging. Even in the general student population, uh, only a small percentage of students um, really uh, score you know, at a, at a uh, proficient level. And, and those numbers are even much lower for students who are English language learners or students who have disabilities. And um, we strongly believe that all students can learn mathematics, whether they're English language learners or have disabilities or are general education students. And, uh, and must have the support to be successful in mathematics. And so um, that was one of the reasons why we've developed the Math for All program. And if you can go to the next slide. I mean, it's not surprising that students are underperforming um, on those uh, standardized achievement tests uh, because teachers themselves also often don't feel fully prepared to deal with the broad range of students that they have in their classroom. So there's research that shows that, um, you know, less than half of the teachers feel well enough prepared to uh, differentiate uh, mathematics instruction and to provide high quality instruction to all students. And even fewer teachers really feel prepared to incorporate students' cultural backgrounds into mathematics instruction. And so the, the data that we have is, you know, predates the pandemic and we all know that things have only gone downhill since um, you know, schooling was majorly disrupted and um, students um, are dealing with unfinished learning. So, so there's an even greater need right now as we're starting to recover from the pandemic um, to um, address this need. I'm handing it over to Matt, who will continue. Hi, everybody. Uh, I echo Babette's welcome and thank you for joining us. We're very excited to be here, but we're even more excited that you're here. Um, I want to tug at your heartstrings just a little bit and play this video for you because it says a lot about why we do what we do and for whom. So please let me know if the audio doesn't come across. I think I've done everything I'm supposed to, but please let me know if it doesn't come across. Dear teacher, I know it doesn't always seem like it, but I really do want to listen and learn. It's just my brain. It's kind of different. So this is what I'd like you to know about me. I have to move or I really can't pay attention. Even though I'm not looking at you, I can still listen to what you're saying. If you tell me, sit up straight, now I have to use all of my brain to do just that. It makes me feel sad when you tell me to try harder, even though I've already tried as hard as I can. I actually listen better when I'm rocking in my chair. When you give me a bunch of directions, I start to think, I will never remember all of this. Sometimes my mom or dad ends up doing all of my homework. So here's how you could maybe help. 
Let me get up and move while I'm learning. Let me look wherever I want when you talk to me. Let me rock or slouch in my chair. No matter what, please don't take away my recess. Give me hope I could do all by myself. Make directions very short. Just ask me, what does your brain need right now? And one more thing. My brain might be different than yours, but it's still amazing. Sincerely, your student. Your student. Your student. Your student. I love that YouTube always goes on to the next thing and tries to tell you what you should be watching. I love this video for lots of reasons. I love it because it reminds us that the students are who we're here for and who we're working for. And I often find that everybody in any, any audience that I show this video to connects with at least one of the students that is there. And they've had at least one of those students in the class. And so for me, it was the student who says, um, uh, I learn better when I'm rocking in my chair and or when you uh, when you ask me to sit still I have to use all of my brain power to do just that and that was my lesson in the first year of my teaching there was a student who was doing just that he could not sit still and it drove me nuts and I kept asking him just sit still sit down work on the assignment and the special education teacher came in and she said you know when you ask him to do that that's where his brain goes. So he can't work on the mathematics. And that was such an eye-opening experience for me. And so ever since then, I've, I've paid attention to that. And it was just, so I love this video. I also try to watch, so it's not possible in this situation. I try to watch people's faces when the little girl says, no matter what, please don't take away my recess. Um, and to Amy, yes, for sure, we can um, share the link for that video. But I can also tell you that if you search Google for Dear Teacher video, it comes up pretty close to the top of the list. So, um, so what is Math for All and why? Dear whoops, Teacher. Why do we do it? So one of the reasons that we show this video in a Math for All presentation is, um, comes out in the, the young lady who says, when you start to list a set of instructions, I start to think, I'm never going to remember all this. And in Math for All, we want to look at that student and we want to look at who she is because many, many, many times it's not the mathematics that are getting in the way of the instruction or the student's understanding of the mathematics. Many times it's something else. And in that young lady's case, she shuts down as soon as you start to list all the instructions. So what we do uh, math for All is professional development for teachers. We're focusing on the teachers, but it's focused on planning lessons that meet the needs of their learners. So we ask them to look at the learners in their classroom and we ask them to look at the lessons that they're providing. So we're planning those lessons. It's not a new math curriculum. We don't pretend to have a silver bullet. We are, um, we're providing a framework that allows them to plan their instruction using the materials that you already have at the school. The mathematical goals remain rigorous. They are important. We're not watering down the mathematics. We're changing the instruction. We're adapting the instruction. We work really hard on and, and highlight uh, the collaborative lesson planning between general education teachers and specialized teachers. And by specialized, I mean special education teachers, bilingual teachers, anybody else who has um, some sort of other lens that they can bring to the table because their experience and their expertise are different often. And so bringing them both to the table provides those two different perspectives and makes the lesson that much better and the instruction that much better. We work on planning adaptations that allow for access to the mathematics. That's our focus instead of watering down the mathematics, like I said. And we start and we push really hard to start from a strength-based 
perspective, from an asset base. Um, and so we think about what are the students' capabilities and what do they bring to the table, as well as what are some of the obstacles that might get in the way to, of accessing the mathematics. So how do we do? We're gonna take you through a little exercise that might give you, that might illustrate how we do this. So imagine you need to fill your pantry or your refrigerator. So you need to go to the grocery store. And for now, we'll pretend that grocery stores don't do delivery or you know anything like that. But if that's part of your routine, that's fine too. But imagine a trip to the grocery store. Share in the chat or just think for yourself about all the things that you need to do to make that successful, to make a successful trip. So it could be things like making a list, remembering all the things that you need to get, but, but keep, on, keep throwing them in. Thank you, Karen. You need to have money and you need to know how much money you have. Um, you need to know what you need to get. You need to think about transportation to and from the grocery store. Estimate the time that it'll take and make that happen. Driving to the store. Um, remembering um, reusable bags, if that's something that you do. Looking at recipes, making a list, remembering where I parked the car, yes. Um, a mask, yes, yeah, very uh, current demand, uh, choosing a time that isn't busy for shopping. So thinking about who's at the store, counting money out, adding up the items to see that I have enough, paying attention to that kind of thing. Where are my car keys? I presume you mean car keys. Um, where the items are in the store. Thank you, Sarah, because that's a, that's a good one that um, I haven't seen somebody mention before. Remembering a quarter for the cart if you're going to Aldi. <laughs> nice. Uh, so that they so that you can have access to that cart. So this is a great list. Sale ads, looking at sale ads to see where you're going to go to get the things that you need. Pushing the shopping cart down the aisles, avoiding bumping into somebody else, or telling your son not to walk behind you and tread your ankles. Coupons, thank you. Um, so lots and lots and lots of these things, and. Taking a look in your refrigerator, taking a look in your pantry, think about what you need. Asking for help if you need something on a higher shelf or if you need something on a lower shelf. I don't bend as well as I used to. Uh, so if there are things in the back, you know, that might be a bit of an issue. So yeah, so there are lots of interactive things that you might also need to do. Okay, this is a phenomenal list. Thank you all. And um, so, I'm gonna sidetrack us for just a second and we'll come back to this list. But one of the tools that we use in Math for All is called the Neurodevelopmental Framework. This Neurodevelopmental Framework is um, a model of how our brain works. And all of the things that we engage, anytime we, in, we do an activity, we think, we learn, anytime our brain is engaged, and these eight components construct all of the aspects of our brain that we need to consider. So you can see language, memory, attention, social cognition, higher order thinking, neuromotor functioning, spatial ordering, and temporal and sequential ordering. So we have a, I have a question for you now. And that is to think about the demands that we just listed for the grocery shopping. And where do some of those things fall into these particular constructs and these categories? And I'll kick us off. Again, please post it in the chat because I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, oh, and I missed one. Thank you, Maureen. What are you going to do when you get there and the shelf is empty from the thing you thought you were going to get? Um, but again, please post these in the chat if you'd like, but I'll kick us off with some of the maybe neuromotor function. As somebody mentioned, pushing a cart. That definitely takes neuromotor function. Uh, somebody mentioned, I don't want to give too much away, but somebody mentioned um, pushing a cart down the aisle. And that could be both neuromotor function or spatial ordering. 
uh, memory is coming up in the chat. So say more about memory, if you would. Spatial order for finding the items in the store and remembering. Oh, so here's, a, here's one that might fit in two of these categories. Remembering where things are in the store. Not getting distracted by items I don't need. Definitely an attention. Um, attention to details to find the item on the shelf, right? Do you need a big can? Do you need a little can? Do you need 40 pounds of flour or do you just need the five pound bag? So paying attention to that. Using language to ask for help. And, and I might add that that's also a social cognition, right? So finding the right language that you need to ask somebody for help. And if they're not understanding, well, I need the, that thing in those little cans that are like peppers or describing it in a way that somebody else understands you. So that's both language and social cognition. Um, so can I speak the language of the deli counter worker, right? Um, can you interact with them? So there were a few things that people mentioned in memory and those, Things like remembering your bags, remembering where you parked, thinking about where your car keys are. There were also some things that required a lot of planning. And I think those fall into the higher order cognition. Thinking about meals coming up in the future, thinking about reading a recipe, understanding what's in your pantry and what you still need to get. Uh, I like to throw in because it's really mathematics specific, but thinking about unit price for particular items if you are a um, price comparer, like I am. My kids will tell you I come home with four boxes of cereal because it was on sale. Um, remembering you part, yeah, when you leave. Higher order function, finding the better deal. Right, Sarah, that's exactly what I was describing. Um, calculating to stay if I'm in my budget. Thank you, Christina. I forget to pay attention always to the chat, but I, I appreciate all these. Um, so all of these things come into just a grocery shop. Oh my goodness, a grocery shopping trip. And so we think about them in relation to this neurodevelopmental framework. So, uh, and then one more, can I figure out who ahead of me at the deli is being waited on? Spatial ordering and memory and social cognition. I would say that one falls into several categories, right? Um, I might even add higher order cognition, paying attention to those around you and deciding who got there first. Lots of different places. These are all great. Thank you so much. So here's the next thing that I wanna ask you to do. Still thinking about those demands and this neurodevelopmental framework. Here's the next question. What do you do to overcome some of these challenges to grocery shopping? And I'll start it out by saying that my memory is not what it used to be. And my children will definitely tell you that. But I don't always come out of the store with everything that I went into the store to get. Um, using the clicker on my, keys to, on my keys to find my car. Yes, right? So the memory, I have to make a list. If I don't make a list, I'm going to come out of there missing many of the things that I went to get. I usually end up coming with some more stuff than is on my list, but that might be an attention thing or that might be higher order cognition. Do we really need these? Cheetos, yes, Cheetos. A calculator, right? If you are a comparison shopper and you want to know which one has the best unit price, sure. I'm gonna throw in higher order cognition in deciding if one is really cheap, but you've had it before and it doesn't taste very good. Do you buy the more expensive item anyway? So, so there's some higher order cognition, making decisions. Uh, so I see in here lists, phone apps, timers. Yes, listing items in the aisle order, definitely, definitely. And that can help you navigate through the store. But then you also have to remember what things are in the store. So um, more demands, using the aisle signs in the store. Reorganizing my list. <laughs> yes, we have some very seasoned shoppers here. Thank you. Practice asking for certain items if it's not my primary language. Nice. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, GPS to find the grocery store. Okay. In another state or country, a place I'm not familiar. 
Uh, going to store when the, where there are less people, therefore fewer distractions, right? Um, asking for help. Oh, whoops, uh, that was the wrong scroll. Sorry. I thought I was on the chat and it wasn't. Planning a route through the store, watching, yes, watching for each item. Yeah, so, so these are great, right? So these are adaptations that we make for ourselves to overcome some of the challenges that we might face as we engage in a grocery shop trip, right? So stepping back and looking at the things that we just engaged, the process we just engaged, one of the first things we did was think about what we need to do, right? What is our goal? Our goal is to fill the pantry or the refrigerator at home. And I'll add one more demand that I just thought of. When we get home, we have to put the things away. And we have to get home in time for the ice cream not to melt or you know the, the frozen goods to still be frozen. So we have to put that in there too. So there's, there's an even longer list of demands that we didn't think about. But the first thing was to, to maintain our goals, to think about our goals. And the second thing we did was to think about all the things that we needed to do in order to make that happen. And then the third thing we did is if any of those are gonna be a challenge, how can we provide ourselves the tools that will help us mitigate those challenges? And in that is the crux of math for all. Uh, so I'm going back to the chat for just a second. I'd like to make sure my family members are home to help me unload the car. Yes, yes, right? Um, we did this with one group of people. <laughs> And somebody said, well, I usually go shopping in another city because I don't want anybody to see me. So I have to think about how, when I have not enough time to get there. So that was a demand that I haven't seen anybody else list. But that's what we do in math for all. Only instead of a grocery shopping trip, we think about a math task or a math lesson. One of the first things we do is we make sure we understand what the goals of that lesson are. Then we do that lesson as a student and we understand the demands of that task. What are we asking the students to do? What are we asking them to engage in? What are we asking them to think about? What are we asking them to plan for? What are we asking them to write? What are we asking them to remember? What are we asking them to say? What are we asking them to hear? All of those demands. And when we do it, uh, you'll, if we, um, when we do that, we start listing a whole lot of things that we might not have thought about if we didn't actually do the task. And then the second thing we do is we understand who the student is as a learner. And we, um, in Math for All, in the professional development, we focus on one student for several reasons. One is so that as we're learning this process, it's not an overwhelming process to try to understand all 30 of our students. And for those of you who are at a high school, all you know, 150 students that you might see in a day. So when we think about math for all, as we're learning the process, we focus on one student and we really get to know that one student so that as the cycle happens and as the professional development happens, the thinking that we do about the task and about the student becomes sort of habitual and it becomes easier and easier to do uh, for more students. The other reason that we do this is that any adaptations that we make with one student in mind, we've learned and we've heard teachers say that whatever we do for one student benefits many students in the room. So if we create a graphic organizer of some sort, there are gonna be lots of students that uh, benefit from using that graphic organizer. But it might not be everybody. It might not be something that everybody needs. And I'll talk about that in just a second too. So we understand the demands of the task and we understand the student as a learner all through this neurodevelopmental framework. So we're, we're thinking about the same components of the lesson and the student and we plan focused adaptations, targeted and focused adaptations to the lesson and the instruction. 
so it's, it's a student who struggles with spatial organization and they just write all over the page, then if we help them with a graphic organizer, they may be able to put their information in a way that gives them access to the mathematics and they can learn the mathematics in a way that they might not have been able to if we just give them the blank page. But it has nothing to do with, I can't say nothing. It has something to do with other than the mathematics, not necessarily the mathematics getting in the way of that case. And we look really hard at the student to see what those uh, obstacles might be. So that is, that's the crux of math for all. We like to think there are some uniquenesses in math for all, and that's a really hard word to look at, but uh, we like to think there are some uniquenesses in math for all. And the neurodevelopmental framework is one of those uniquenesses. And I'm a latecomer to this process, but Babette is actually one of the developers of the program. And I always say that if I had, if I had known about math for all when I was in the classroom, my students would have been so much better off. But this neurodevelopmental framework gives us a way to structure the way we look at the students and the way we look at the math lessons. And so it helps to understand both of those. Um, one of the others is a strong focus on the collaboration. And if we have two or more people looking at the lesson and looking at a student, we have that much better chance of really understanding both. So there's a collaborative effort in, um, in the lesson planning we do in Math for All. The lesson planning around a focal student is unique. For in many other professional developments, we see uh, people doing, um, working on uh, techniques to use in the classroom and in structural practices. We, we look at it from a different perspective. We focus on mathematics. We focus in mathematics content, right? But it's applicable to any content. The way we do this is applicable to any content. And so it's very generalizable. And we actually hear teachers talk about that, that they've used it in other um, content in their classes. And it also applies to grade level. We focus K-5. And the program is written for K-5 mathematics, but it's applicable to any content and other grade levels. Uh, one of the things that we hear teachers say about it is that it's structured and yet flexible in the lesson planning cycle with supporting tools. So we have some of the tools that we offer. And one of the things that we like to say is that we focus on the learning instead of the teaching. So we focus on what the student is gonna learn instead of what we're gonna say to them and how they're, uh, what, we, what we show them how to do. So I'm gonna turn it back to Babette, who's gonna tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've done in the past and what we've found as results from, from people who have been through the professional development. Great, thank you, Matt. So we have been working in Illinois for the past seven years and we had a previous grant from the Institute of Education and Sciences at the US Department of Education to do a large scale randomized control study of um, math for all. And we worked in collaboration with Chicago Public Schools, um, 32 schools from all across the cities, um, including uh, about 100 teachers and 1,500 students. And we got some um, very positive results, which actually helped us to um, obtain our current grant, which is um, an effort to scale up our work um, across Illinois. And we're working now with um, um, school districts in, you know, in rural areas, suburban areas, so in, in different parts of the state. Um, so some of the impacts that we have been able to document um, are include uh, impacts on teachers, on classroom practices, as well as on student achievement. So in terms of teacher impacts on teachers, um, teachers um, become more comfortable and feel more prepared to teach mathematics to the wide range of students that they have in their classroom. And they also improve in their understanding of how to select instructional strategies based on individual students' learning profiles. And in terms of classroom practices that we have um, measured using the class observation tool, um, we, felt we were able to document increased emotional support, instructional support, and classroom organization 
among maths for all teachers compared to uh, teachers who were in a control group. And then last but not least, we were also able to document um, increased um, performance on the NWEA map test that um, CPS um, has been using in the past um, to assess mathematics achievement. So I'm now turning it over to um, the specialist from the IRC who have been working with us for the past year. And um, they will share a little bit more about their uh, impressions of the program and um, some of their thoughts about uh, possibly continuing it once our grant funding ends. So I didn't know if Sylvia was going to give us a little intro to the Illinois Resource Center. If not, I can do that. Christina, go ahead. Oh, okay. So the Illinois Resource Center is a, a nonprofit organization uh, part, uh, funded in part, uh, in great part by um, the Illinois State Board of Education to provide professional development and technical assistance to schools, the entire state of Illinois. Um, and so we do that uh, through a, a range of services. So we provide regional um, professional development. We do um, what well, we used to do sessions at our face-to-face uh, -face at our, our session at our center in Arlington Heights, as well as across the country. But we've shifted during the pandemic to do primarily um, virtual uh, professional development. And um, so the, um, we can share a link to our, our site. We have many free um, uh, resources and professional development calendar uh, throughout the year. And um, my colleagues and I, we have actually, there, there are more of us, like seven of us um, total. And um, we provide services uh, all related primarily to the education of English language learners, uh, multilingual learners. And that's that's primarily our, our and their families. That's primarily our focus pre-K through um, actually graduate school, because we, we also teach graduate classes um, for the licensure for bilingual ESL. Uh, and we have a, a bilingual conference and we partner with ESSA. And uh, we also have this uh, lovely partnership with, um, with Math for All. So a little intro about what we do. And Sylvia, thank you for sharing that. When you go into our, we, we also do contractual um, uh, work with, with different entities, um, but, we, but our main work is that um, fulfilling our contract with the State Board of Education. Thanks, Christina. Um, I was hoping to hear uh, maybe from some of the other specialists. Elizabeth, I don't know if you want to, um, you know, give it a go and just uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about your experience now that you are, along with the other folks at the IRC, um, a facilitator, a math for all uh, facilitator. Yeah, so I have been um, participating in the facilitation of math for all. And something that I've noticed is what uh, Matt was referring to as far as the, the structured aspect of the program, but yet there's a lot of room for teacher collaboration and for conversations. So um, the, the succession of the, the program is clear and the, the, uh, the paradigm of using the, the neural developmental framework is very clear. But then within that, teachers are really encouraged to choose their own focal student that they wanted to concentrate on and, and think about within these uh, this, idea of looking at the different lenses and looking at that student through those different lenses. And then um, there's a, a routine basically of planning a lesson, teaching a lesson, reflecting on that lesson, all thinking about that one uh, focal student. And that focal student is encouraged to be a student who's kind of uh, considered an outlier in the sense that um, there's something about that student that that um, you know whether they have special needs or if they're an English learner or something that um, helps the teacher kind of think about what that student needs and then is able to uh, think about what that student is really good at in terms of that neural developmental uh, framework and then what are possibly the the needs of that student and planning for that student and then doing all the reflecting on it actually can make us a better teacher for all of our students. So I've really seen that happen. And um, I, I too wish that I had this framework when I was a teacher. I think it really would have helped me um, think about my students in a different light 
and think about what my students needed in terms of, of math instruction. Math instruction for, for some teachers can be quite a challenge as we see in those statistics. So um, I have found this to be really uh, beneficial for the, the teachers that I've worked with so far. Thanks, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, Rachel, you are a bilingual director in a district. Can you talk a little bit more about how that, that component of that co-planning with other teachers and bringing that team effort um, into making this really um, something successful? Yeah, definitely, Sylvia. One of the things I think too, um, that has stood out for, for me for Math for All and our participation in the program and then becoming, uh, getting trained to be facilitators, is just that lens and that strong focus on math. I think oftentimes, you know, here in the last decade, we've had such a focus on literacy. Um, and so many of our professional learning experiences relate back to literacy, but this just brings us right to math and says, how are we gonna really approach math instruction? Um, focusing on those focal students, um, but also just thinking through how do we make it accessible for all kids? And so what I really like about the, the whole planning process and the lesson planning development is um, the whole team can come to the table and everybody has a different focal student in mind. And as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, generally those focal students are outliers, but aren't always your, your low kiddos who are struggling outliers. Sometimes there's those outliers of those students who are uh, high achievers who need additional enrichment um, and often take some of your focus away too from the instructional aspect. So everybody kind of comes together and it's not just a, let me sit here um, with just the colleagues who I'm consistently you know, working with, but let me include all of those specialists, including that special ed teacher, including those um, EL or multilingual specialists at the table too, um, and talking through how do we approach each of those aspects of the neural develop developmental framework. And it has really just been such a great partnership, I think, that we've had at the IRC, our focus on multilingual learners, and then with Math for All, and we're really able to kind of bring those two worlds together and think through how do our multilingual learners approach a lot of this math instruction. And it, for me, it just goes back to that, that deeper dive into knowing who your students are, knowing some of their ins and outs, like that video Matt had shared, knowing what how kiddos learn best, and then how do we use that to harness some of our math instruction and really elevate it from there. So I really just enjoyed, I guess, that the focus on, on math specifically, um, but it, you can really then start to see how does this impact my work in all of my other areas of, of teaching. Yeah, thank you. Christina, any additional points to add for that? Well, yeah, I just, just to, I, I um, agree with what my colleagues, um, Elizabeth and Rachel said, and I think this, this idea of this very thoughtful um, conversation and, and doing the math together, it, get, it, it makes us all a little bit vulnerable, but, but in, you know, in our times together planning, and, and it's, I think it's a really good model for professional development because teachers, as, as uh, Babette mentioned in the statistics, I mean, there isn't a lot of confidence around, you know, as math education. And I just find it a very, um, like a vulnerable kind of like way of talking about like, let's do the math. We do the math and think of it as, as, as the student experiences it. And, um, but then it's that systematic way because of the neurodevelopmental framework, a systematic way to look at each one of these, um, these, these elements. I, I have found already, I've, I've talked to both Babette and, and um, Matt about how it's really impacted a lot of other areas of my work. It's just, a, it's a, an excellent, I think there are a lot of tools that I used in this professional learning that um, really have a lot of implications for all different areas. And, and I too, Rachel and Elizabeth, love that we're talking about mathematics. Um, I, I love all my other work, but I just, it's so nice to be able to, to just talk and, and about mathematics. And, and it is such a gatekeeping uh, tool in terms of achievement for our multilingual learners, as well as children with special education needs. And then our bilingual learners who are also have special education needs, right? The, the math achievement component is such a gatekeeping mechanism. And, and I find that this is really exciting in terms of giving them access um, and building confidence for teachers, so. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think when I think about math, I really think about how difficult it was for me, right? Because I'm an, I'm an English learner, I was an ESL student, um, and it really was difficult for me to understand math. And it wasn't until 
my high school years that I felt I was maybe grasping it. And even now as an adult, um, I'm a little bit timid when, when the discussion of math is brought, you know, sometimes it's that self-confidence has, was never built in me. And sometimes I will excuse myself and probably look away sometimes if I feel I don't know what to say in this conversation. You know, I don't want to feel lost. Um, but I think it also is maybe an, uh, an issue of equity, right? And how well and rigorous instruction, uh, you know, if you're in the well-to-do, you know, affluent neighborhoods, you probably get access to rigorous math. You probably have devices. You probably have tutors and all that kind of stuff that not all, you know, I'm thinking of certain zip codes that they may not have that those kind of resources and that supports. Um, and we have to meet the students where they are. And we have to think about those students who really need those additional supports. And, um, you know, I, Math for All and this program really, I think, is doing that. Um, so I'm really very excited that the IRC is part of this program. And I can't wait to see where we take it once we, you know, make it our own and then, you know, continue to offer it um, as part of our services at the IRC. Um, Matt, any anything that you'd like to share about um, before we, um, well, we, we still have some time. Um, can we take any questions from um, audience members? Well, before we do, I, I yes. want to say that we are also thrilled with the partnership with IRC, and I think I'm speaking for both me and Babette, um, partly because of all the things that you just brought up. But um, we are we're we're thrilled to have this aspect of bilingual and English language learners um, brought to the table with us because we are all about collaboration. So, uh, so I will. Um, I'll share the screen again um, because there are a couple more screen, a couple more thing, things that we want people to say to see. But we do have time for um, questions and answers if you'd like. Yeah, feel free to type your questions into chat. Um, we can all see that there. If you want to send it to just the hosts and panelists, you can do that, or you can switch over to everyone so we can all see your questions. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question on the microphone, feel free to raise your hand using the icon at the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of Zoom, there's a raise hand icon, and I can set it up so you can unmute your microphone and ask the question on the mic. So I think uh, Sylvia, Rachel, Elizabeth, uh, I think we are, we talked about this, this potential IRC offerings, and we're still having that conversation. Um, because of the, the, the model that Math for All uses, um, we had to see how that fits because it's a year long, uh, pretty intensive coaching and presenting and planning. Um, and we, we really have to have a discussion about how that will fit within the scope of the work we do at the Illinois Resource Center. We're hoping, um, Arlen, if, it's, if you're open, <laughs> to have another meeting, maybe in the spring, where we've been, we'll be able to share a little bit more definitive um, uh, you know, plans and structures of how we'd like to, to engage with, the, with all our, you know, our state uh, and out-of-state uh, colleagues um, around uh, Math for All. But we're also interested in that input, like what what works now in these days, you know, what works in terms of professional learning um, around around math and how could we would really, I think, appreciate ideas for what what is best suited to your particular situation. Yeah, I want to keep in mind that, you know, um, being a principal is uh, you know, principals are influencers in their schools. And certainly I'm, you know, calling out specifically any principals on here. If you think that this is something that you'd like to see in your schools, um, that you think obviously, you know, when, when you think about your students, that this could be beneficial to them, uh, please reach out because this is a research-based, you know, program. Uh, this is, um, it's, it's legit. And we want to give it away for free, essentially, you know, we want people to participate in this as much as possible. Um, but knowing that math, you know, as I think Elizabeth said, or, or Rachel, maybe, um, can be difficult even for teachers themselves to approach it, right? Um, but, you know, um, math for all folks are here, the IRC folks are here, 
Um, and we really want to be, you know, we want to support math teachers, the principals trying to bring this into your schools. Um, it's essential. It, this is an essential topic to, we can't leave math for those who can do it. We have to continue to think about the students who are continue to struggle in this area. Um, because as I, you know, opened up with, it's, my gosh, it's in every single part of our lives, whether we are aware of it or not. You know, math is essential to our, what we do every day. Um, so I just, I, you know, I just wanted to make those two comments really quickly. Um, I don't know if I saw any questions. Is there a question? Oh, I see a question. Josie had a question for Matt um, about maybe describing the typical uh, maybe process that a, 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 a school or district might go through um, in deciding about, about engaging with math for all uh, professional learning. Sure, uh, we can talk a little bit about it. Um, we have, it, but it'll, it'll sort of echo everything that's already been said. So what we're trying to do now, um, we have this PD series, which is five days long and it's full days and there's some work in between in taking the lesson and trying it out with your students and seeing how the, um, the adaptations that we plan go and then reflecting on it and making changes for the next time. Um, but so these are some potential things that we've thought about doing, and that is the, the full math for all PD series at a school. And if you're interested in pursuing doing something like that, like Sylvia said, please reach out. Um, but we're also considering ideas of some shorter workshops based on the math for all ideas and uh, the ideas of, of the neurodevelopmental framework and making lessons more inclusive for uh, students, for the diverse learners in your room or whomever it is that you have questions about. And so that could be a smaller chunk of it. Um, and that could be at a school level, that could be, uh, you know, sort of some one day ideas. Um, but we're also thinking about doing a course with through IRC's typical offering. And so that could be uh, pairs of teachers that come together, a team of teachers that come together from your school and participate in the fuller thing, but then it's not the whole school that's involved. So these are ideas about the way uh, things might play out in the coming years. Um, but you'll see at the bottom that there is a link to a document where we're asking for information from you if you're interested in getting information from us. Uh, it's goedc.org slash IRC hyphen MFA, Math for All. Uh, Illinois Resource Center hyphen Math for All. So if you are interested and or just want to be included in future updates and that sort of thing, we'd love to have your contact information about that. Um, so, are there any other questions? I don't see any others in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay, so then our last is just to say thank you for being here. Um, and, you know, one more plug for that goedc.org, IRC hyphen MFA. And we'd love to have your contact information so we can reach out as things sort of subtle and, um, and we understand more about what we're gonna do and potentially have another uh, webinar in the spring. So that's where, um, that's where we'll leave it. I'll turn it back to uh, Arlen unless somebody else has another comment. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Nobody's got their hand raised. Um, oh, here comes a question from Rachel. Not sure who manages that link, but the, is telling me and I need to be a part of the organization to access it. Matt, any um, I will. I will that? fix that. I do know exactly what's going on, and I will fix that. I apologize. That's a uh, it's a Google form, and so 
it, it's about the settings that I forgot to click a little button. But I will fix that as soon as we are off. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the Illinois Resource Center and Matt for all. Really appreciate you sharing your insights and strategies with us today. I want to thank all of the attendees for coming as well. This was recorded, and I will be posting the recording link um, to YouTube tomorrow and sending out a message to everybody who's in attendance and everybody who's registered. Um, for those in attendance for the full hour, you will get one professional development clock hour for attending the session. There'll be an evaluation sent out to you um, with the webinar uh, recording tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. It'll be coming directly from me, uh, Arlen at ILPrinciples.org. But again, thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to our participants. You're all free to log out and we will see you back here in the spring. I love the idea of a follow-up uh, webinar. We will get together on that. We're booking now for February and March. Um, so that will be perfect timing. That'd be great. Great. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Arlen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, a couple questions, actually. Was it? Oh, oh. no, that's okay. <laughs>